excited. Uh, you would spend your Wednesday night here with us at the return. And so for those of you um, who don't know me, or for those of you that I haven't gotten the chance to meet yet, um, my name is Kelsey, um, and I have been coming here on Wednesday nights um, since about mid-2013, um, when I was just a junior in college. And so um, now I get uh, the great privilege of leading under Ben here, and I basically um, have the coolest job in the world because I get to work with you guys and I get to um, spend my time um, focusing on the return and what God um, is doing in this place and doing through you guys. And so um, just to see uh, how this ministry has grown since 2013, um, it's just become such a huge part of my life. So um, when I say thank you for being here and spending time um, just listening to Ben when he teaches or listening to me when I'm up here, um, I just really um, thank you guys for that. But if you were here last week, even if you weren't, um, what we have, what we're going to spend this summer doing is jumping in um, to this series called Citizens of Heaven. And so um, Citizens of Heaven is based um, off of the book of Philippians. And so Philippians is not just another book in the Bible, but it, it's an actual real letter um, from a real man named Paul. And so Paul wrote this letter to a church in Philippi, and this is, happens to be a church that Paul planted himself. And so um, what you need to know is Paul is writing this letter from prison. Paul is in Rome in prison, um, and the church Philippi is in, is in Greece. And so Paul has been thrown into jail um, by the Ro Roman government for proclaiming Jesus as king. Um, so that's kind of what's happening in in this letter right now and so when we read it we often read um the bible um like chapters and verses and so um the way this was originally written is like i said like a real letter from paul and so um real quick just a little tidbit about me um besides you all know my name and some of you all know me well but right now um i am currently uh struggling through this thing called grad school and um, I, use the, I use the term grad school very lightly um, because it's so hard for me to manage um, working full time and uh, taking classes that I literally can only take like three to six hours like a semester. And so I'm like, is it really grad school if I'm only in one class? A semester like I don't know but I use the term struggling through grad school I use that very appropriately because I am indeed struggling um, I'm supposed to be doing like this independent study class this summer um, I got the syllabus in May and I kid you not I have not done one thing on the syllabus so everything is due August like 18th and I debate every day like I should just quit so um, I'm, I'm struggling through that right now, but um, I have found some meaning in all of it, and I'm going to share that with you all, because last semester, um, from, from January to May, I was in uh, this class called Interpreting the New Testament, and so what we do in like interpreting the Old Testament and interpreting the New Testament is the teacher picks a book whether from the Old Testament or the New Testament. And we, we study through that book all semester using the tools and things that the teacher is teaching us. And so what happened this past semester, January through May, um, we as a class online, we studied through the book of Philippians. And it's also important, important for me to note that we didn't just study the whole, the whole um, letter in Philippians, we focused specifically on chapter two. Um, when Ben assigned what, what chapter in Philippians I was gonna teach, um, when he assigned me chapter 2, he did not even know that I had been studying Philippians chapter 2 um, for five months. And so I know that that was the Lord at work saying, Kelsey, you're going to preach on Philippians 2. And so I kid you not, I have been studying. The semester started in January. I've written like eight papers on Philippians chapter 2. So if y'all don't take any way, anything away from my message, I really am dropping out of school. Because you know, you know that I didn't learn anything. So you're probably like, how is it okay or interesting to study one chapter, one chapter of the Bible for six months straight? And you know, I asked myself the same thing. But every time I read the 30 verses of chapter 2, I'm not exaggerating. Like, something new stood out to me each time, like every time I read it. And so um, something I just want to share with you really quick in one of my commentaries for class, this is what um, the author, he had to say about Philippians. If you question why we should study a chapter of the Bible for six months. Um, so for, his name's Frank Thielman. He writes this in his commentary. 
20 centuries ago, a traveling tent maker named Paul was tossed into prison for creating a public disturbance. There, he spent a considerable time writing a letter that might have taken up a dozen sheets of stiff, scratchy paper. Today, few people would recognize the name of the Roman emperor at that time. Although Nero was a prolific author, nothing of his literary output remains. Paul's name, on the other hand, is instantly recognized by millions. Today, there are easily one million existing copies of his letter to the Philippians in numerous different languages. So he's, he's talking about this letter that we have in our possession today that's in this book, right here at our fingertips. And so since then, the Roman Empire has come and long gone. But 2,000 years later, we are still study, studying and marveling over the words that Paul wrote. And so um, if you wonder why we're studying this, that's why. Millions of people all over the earth, million different of copies, copies in different languages, we have it here. We're reading it today. The emperor at that time, none of his work is really remembered. And so um, I think that sets us up very well to dive into Philippians chapter 2. And so I'm going to be reading um, my Bible right here. It's from the New Living Translation. But if you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to follow along with that because it'll help you. Um, so last week, um, Ben introduced this kind of anchor this kind of, um, this verse that Paul says, that's like an anchor to the whole letter. And it says this, and it's chapter 1, verse 27. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. So a major theme that you're going to be able to pick up on quickly um, throughout this letter is, is this theme of unity. And Paul uses this language throughout the letter, um, like this kind of like athletic language. Like he's talking about the body of Christ like a team fighting together. And so just keep that in mind, like unity. And we defined unity last week as sort of um, this sense of togetherness and this common ground. That's what unity is. And so um, Paul goes on in chapter 1 last week, we learned to warn the church in Philippi that they have enemies, that there are some who are preaching the gospel um, with wrong motives. And so they do that selfishly um, to call attention to themselves, not to call attention to the gospel, but because they want to be famous and they want to be known like Paul. And so we go from Paul um, saying, stand strong against opposition from outside the church. And so in chapter two, we're going to move to stand, st like stand strong within the church, within the body. And so Paul knows that they have trials and um, opposition coming their way, and that if the church is going to be effective in spreading the gospel, um, that they have to practice what they preach, that they can't just pretend to love each other, but they have to really love each other. And so without being unified, they won't accomplish much. People won't want to buy what the church is selling if they don't practice what they preach. And so um, Paul wants the, uh, the Philippian church to be able to present themselves as, as credible witnesses um, to the unbelieving world. Does that make sense? He knows uh, that opposition is coming, and so he wants their words to match up with their actions, and he wants them to get along, like really get along doing that. Um, and so I thought about it like this. We all know, whether you were in high school or college, like, what it's like to be in a group project. So teacher assigns a group project and you usually don't get to pick your partners. And so when you think about a group project, um, what happens, well, usually, what hopefully happens is everyone in the group has the same goal. And so the goal is to get a good grade on the project and um, to ultimately pass the class. But what we often come to find out is that even though everybody has the same goal, every person in that group um, they have a different idea on how to attain that goal. And so once it, once it all starts unfolding, what you'll see is disagreements may, heated disagreements may start to um, arise when everyone's saying, well, this is how we're going to achieve the goal. Or one other thing you'll notice is there's those people who um, they, they have the same goal as you, but they just are like, you know, we're just, we don't want to do any work at all. Yeah, but we still have the same goal. And so there the, there's those people. And so, you know, within that group, you can have the same goal, but you can all think there's a different way to get there. And so what you know is that if your group isn't united, it really hinders the way you get to the final goal. And so Paul knows, like, 
there's not even small groups, like a small group project at this time. Like this is the first small group and Paul knows that like the struggle is just real. And so even though we're talking like that's in college or in high school. And so even talking about a church and a body of believers, like we know that disagreements and drama can, can arise within the church. Like just because it's a body of believers uh, doesn't mean they're exempt from drama. And so Paul, Paul is holding on to a bigger picture here, and he wants the church to do the same thing because the bigger picture is that we all have in common the same goal, and that, that goal is to preach Christ, to make him known. And so the common ground is Christ um, crucified and resurrected. Like, that is our common goal, though we may disagree on a whole number of other things. Like, the capital C Worldwide Church, Christ crucified, resurrected. We have that in common, that we believe in that. And so... Um, we're going to jump in uh, right into chapter 2. But like Ben said last week, I love how he highlighted uh, when you receive a letter, you read the whole letter in one setting. Um, or in one sitting, my bad, sorry. You read it in one sitting, and so you don't stop and read the first chapter. So a lot of things that Paul is laying down um, in the first part of his letter, they like really continuate into the um, second part of the chapter that we have. And so I'm going to pick it up. Um, in verse, the last verse of chapter 1, because his thought flows perfectly into the beginning of chapter 2. So I'm going to read from verse 30, and I'm just going to keep reading right into chapter 2. So verse 30, we are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Chapter 2, so is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? So Paul goes straight into this like back-to-back um, series of rhetorical questions. And I know in um, my NLT translation here, it, ha- it literally has question marks after it. And I know that's not in NIV, but he's like asking them. He knows that the church in Philippi are a mature group of believers, but he's asking them like, are you being fulfilled from being in a relationship with Christ? Like he knows the answer is yes, but he's like getting their mind going like, does this encourage you that you belong to Christ? And so he's saying, like, I know it's tough, but then he goes right on in uh, verse 2, and he says, if so, then do this. Then make me truly happy. He's talking about me, Paul. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind, one purpose. So you have instruction. Agree, love, work together towards that one purpose. So that's the instruction. And so um, thank you to Paul. He has beautifully laid this out for the Philippians and for us. And he doesn't just tell you what to do, but he's going to go on to tell you how to do it. And so he says this right after, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interest, but take an interest in others too. All right, so the first command um, of that sentence is a, is a command not to do something. So he's saying, what is he telling you not to do? He said, don't be selfish. And so we'll start there. Um, but, I mean, maybe we don't need to start there because none of us in this room are selfish, right? None of us, we, uh, like Laura's laughing. She's like, I'm not. Um, none of us, um, we don't try to impress others, right? Right? No, that's not right. I'm being highly sarcastic, but this, literally, this is what, what the text says, and so the reason that, um, that it doesn't feel so pretty to our hearts is because if we're being honest with ourselves, um, we know that sometimes we are selfish. Uh, Sometimes we, we do try to impress others, and so, um, the text, there's this gap between what the text says to do and what I really do, or what I really feel, and so, the thing about selfishness is there's something in me as a human being that's drawn towards selfishness. Nobody had to teach Kelsey Sunderhouse to be selfish. Like, nobody had to teach me that. Like, I was born that way, and so you, you and I, we were born that way, and so I wish it was that simple for us to just g- grasp the command going, don't be selfish, and we could just do it. But like I said, we're born that way, so we don't wake up in the morning going, oh, I just, I think I should be selfish today. Like, it's just a natural kind of reflex, and so when I was preparing for this, wondering like, man, if it's so easy for us to just fall into selfishness, um, what are some of the ways that selfishness really roots itself in deep? And so um, this is one of the ways I kind of discovered was that 
Selfishness is like this expectation to be served, like this intrinsic idea um, that things are just kind of supposed to go our way, um, like the world owes us something, or um, if, if things don't go our way, then life is just unfair, or we're looking for, uh, what can this church offer me? What can this job offer me? What can this school offer me? What can you offer me in this relationship, in this friendship? And so we just kind of, um, we kind of have this deep um, intrinsic feeling that we should just be served. And then um, he goes on to the next phrase that says, then don't try to impress others. And so um, when I was thinking about that, I'm going, we don't wake up going, man, I just really need to impress all these people today. But, but since we all have this kind of desire uh, to be praised, and even if you don't have this desire to be praised, um, we all have this, this deep desire to be noticed, right? Like, you just want to be noticed sometimes for doing something or achieving something. And so, like I said, you don't have to wake up in the morning going, man, I just really need to impress so-and-so. Maybe you do, but maybe it's as simple as like, I need to impress some, someone with this job, with this major, with my accomplishments, with my image, with my Instagram. Like, I just need to, I need to impress these people. And so, like I said, it's not, it's not a choice of going waking up saying, I need, I need to impress the world today, but it's just rooted down deep in us. And so, um, if that's the don't part, let's focus on the do part of the, of the verse. And so he says, but instead, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others too. And so what we have is a command to be humble. And so, so, so far in the first two chapters of this letter, um, our themes are this, unity and humility. In two words, that's the theme so far, because last week Paul is saying be united. This week Paul is saying um, be humble. And so how, how do humility and unity tie together? Well, you do not get unity, big picture unity, without small picture humility. And so a group is not going to be united if each person isn't individually practicing humility within that group. And so let's just define humility really quick. Um, my Bible dictionary, it says, it defines humility this way. The personal, personal quality of being free from arrogance and pride and having an accurate estimate of one's worth. So being humble does not mean um, think lowly of yourself, but being humble by the definition, it says having an accurate view of yourself, an accurate view. So um, humility in relation to um, God is having an accurate view of yourself compared to the creator and sustainer of the universe. What, how do you compare in relationship to God? And so humility would not say, you are nothing, you need to make yourself nothing and feel small. Humility is saying, think accurately of yourself. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. And so if we need more motivation, um, besides Paul just literally saying, be humble, um, listen to what, what James 4, 6 says. It says, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. So God opposes the proud, like he opposes them. And so the last place you really want to find yourself is in opposition from God. And so we know from our definitions that if humility is um, the absence of pride, that we now know on the two ends of the spectrum, we have humility and pride. So pride is the opposite of humility, being prideful. Um, and so he goes on after he says, be humble. It just continues right on in the text. It flows perfectly. He says this, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interest, but take an interest in others too. And so NIV reads the same verse this way. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. And so um, something I learned in, in class was that this word interest, when it says, um, but each of you look to the interest of others. In, the, in like the original Greek language, that word interest, it's not there. So it translates into the English, but it's not there in the Greek. And so interest in the English is just a filler word in our Bible. And so the way that it really translates into the Greek language is this. Let each of you look not only to his own. And then that's it. Like, it's open. Because what Paul is trying to get them to understand is this. You fill it in. Let each of him look not only to his own job, major, 
finances, his own friends, his own house, his own well-being, his own family. It's, it's saying we all have an interest that we look to, and he's saying you fill it in. Whatever you look to the most, don't just look to your own. Look to, look to someone else's things like that. And so that's how that translates into, into the Greek, like the word interest. He wants you to fill it in because he knows we all look to something. We all have our interests, and we're focused on that. And so that's hard. Like if, you, like if you don't think that's hard, then I don't even know if you're human because I, as a natural human inclination, it is to look out for number one. And number one is pretty much always usually yourself. Like your inclination is going to be to look out for your interest. But here is why this command is so important. Here is why without it, the world would be an even bigger mess than it was because think about this. Do you have people in your life or uh, do you all know people who, who are constantly there for you, lifting you up, dropping things left and right to be there when you need it, who, who often put their own interest above, above or put, their, put your interest above their own? Like, does that happen in your life? Do you have a friend or a parent or a sibling that does that for you? Hopefully, but imagine your life if you didn't have that one person. Like, imagine the absence. You would feel their absence. And so, when you start, if none of that, if none of us were those things for other people, like we would feel that absence. It would just be looking out for me, number one, all the time. And so the more we start to focus on being that someone for another person, the more we take our eyes off of ourselves and look to other people's interests above our own. So when, when I thought about summing it up this way, like the placing others' interests above your own, I, I was asking myself this, and I will ask you the same thing. Are you willing to give up, give up an ounce, like just one ounce of your comfort for um, your friend, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, and dare I say, your enemy, a stranger, someone who opposes you. It's not just placing your best friend's interest above yourself. Could you do that for a complete stranger? This is what unity within the church for the cause of the gospel looks like. This is what Paul is preaching. And from here, the letter, to me, it just keeps getting better and better. Um, because Paul, he's told us what to do. He said, be humble. Put others' interests above yourself. But now what Paul's about to do, is he's about to do the most important thing he can do. And he's going to point to Jesus. And so um, the next seven verses, verses 5 through 11, um, these are some of the most informative pieces we have in the Bible um, on the incarnation of God. And so if you want to get all Bible schooly real quick, because that's what I've been doing for six months, um, the incarnation, the word incarnation, it refers to um, the human nature of God. And so the divine God coming from heaven to earth as a human in the form of Jesus. And so the incarnation of Jesus, it, it's this union of divinity and humanity. And so that it would hold that Jesus, he, um, he existed before time in heaven and that Jesus was unalterably, he was God, but then he came to earth and he took on human form. And so that's what people mean when they're talking about the incarnation of Jesus. They mean God coming to earth as a, as a human in Jesus. And so you'll often hear um, John 1, 14, that the word, the word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. So the word is God. That's who it's referring to. The Word became flesh, so became a human, and made its dwelling. Dwelling translates as um, to live or to take up residence. So among us, us, humanity. So the Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. And so that, that, is, um, that is one of the biggest game-changing things we have for us because we have Jesus here on earth showing us the way. And so think about um, the incarnate nature of Jesus as I read these next seven verses and what Paul's telling us about Jesus as God and Jesus as human. And so I'm going to pick it up. Um, I'm still in chapter 2, verse 5, reading through. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and under the earth 
and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So Paul, he started, he started those verses with this. Have the same attitude of Christ. That's the attitude right there. What, what is Paul saying in these verses about Jesus? Because it's beautiful, really. Um, they believe these seven verses, verses to be an early church hymn that they sang hundreds of years before. And so what he's teaching us about Jesus is that Jesus is the epitome of true humility. He is our number one example to look to. Because it says that even though Jesus, he was very nature in God, he was in very nature God, that he gave up his divine privileges. And that phrase, um, he gave up his divine privileges. The way it translates in the Greek is a lot less words. And, and that phrase means um, he emptied himself or he made himself nothing. And so made himself nothing. Like, can you imagine that? I would, can just see us today. Like, that's a phrase that we would have on our top of motivational sayings. We, we um, wake up and read in the morning. Today, I will make myself nothing. Like, no, because our culture, it screams, make yourself something, not make yourself nothing. Like, that is what our culture tells us. And so Jesus, he literally, in the text, in the Greek, the original, he made himself nothing. Even though he could have clung to his divine privileges, he could have stayed in heaven with God, but it says he didn't think of those privileges as something to cling to. Instead, it says he took the humble position of a slave. And so what you need to know about um, this word slave and servant back then, uh, the word servant meant um, that you could come and go as you pleased. But the word slave implied that your master had complete and utter ownership of you. And so Jesus, Paul is referring to Jesus as a slave because Jesus knows who he is. He knows who the master is, and it says that he humbly yields to his master's will, the father's will. And so remember what Paul said about what humble people do? They put others' interest above their own. So, so look at what Jesus did. It says he gave up his divine privileges with the father in heaven to humbly come down here and die for, for the saint, for the sinner, for you and for me. Even knowing that some of us, we might not accept that love or that gesture, Jesus still humbled himself under the Father's will, and he did that. This is what, this is what radical humility looks like. And so um, that's the attitude that Paul says. You need to try to imitate that. You'll never fully be that, but you need to imitate the attitude of Jesus. And so something else, um, just extra, that, that this passage tells us about the character of God is this, that that God didn't just sit back and let humanity be. God sending Jesus to earth from heaven, stepping down from heaven into humanity, he does the th same thing when he steps into your life, initiating towards us. So he steps into your mess to make much of his name, not to make much of your name, but to make much of his name. And so Jesus coming to the earth, is the best thing ever because he initiates towards humankind. He becomes one of us. Just as he steps onto earth, so as he steps into your life in a personal way. And so quickly, that was um, Paul's first example of humility because Paul is going to tell us, be humble, this is how you be humble, and then he's really going to make sure you get it because he's about to give you um, four examples. First was Jesus, the number one example of humility. So now... Um, he's going to point to to Timothy, and then he's going to point to Epaphroditus. And so Timothy has been partnering with Paul, spreading the gospel. We talked about Timothy a little bit last last week, um, but um, Timothy has been with Paul on this mission. And so I'm going to skip um, over to verse 19 really quickly. Um, and this this is what um, Paul says about Timothy. He says um, that he wants to send them back, send Timothy back to the Philippians soon. Because right now Timothy um, is caring for Paul in prison. He's the one who will take him his meals and stuff like that, like Ben described last week. And so he says this, I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the, all the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. And so Paul goes on to say that Timothy has proved himself because he has served with Paul preaching the gospel. And so the, the example of Timothy is this, someone who genuinely cares about your welfare and personally stands by you in life, partnering with you uh, through whatever it throws your way. Everyone needs a Timothy. And so now Paul, is he's going to point to Epaphroditus. 
And Paul said he wants to send Timothy back soon, but that he will send Epaphroditus back immediately. In verse 26, Paul says this, I am sending Epaphroditus, him, back because he has been longing to see you. And he was very distressed that you heard he was ill. And he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him and also on me, so that I would not have one sorrow after another. And then in verse 30, he says this, Epaphroditus, For he risked his life for the work of Christ, and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you could not do from far away. And so do you hear that? It says that Epaphroditus, he was about to die, literally ill to the point of death, because he was helping Paul and partnering with him and spreading the gospel. And so he... It says that, if you catch it and go back and read this later, it says that when he was sick, he was actually more concerned about the Philippians' concern for him. And so, do you see that? Like, Paul has, or Epaphroditus has every reason to be concerned with himself because he was ill to the point of death. But it literally says that he was more concerned that word got back to the church in Philippi that he was sick. And so he was stressed out because he knew that they were worrying about him. And so if you were out, risking your life from the gospel, risking your life for the gospel, and you got so sick you almost died, like, I would be like, this journey is off. I am not going back to Philippi. I'm getting straight home in my privacy, and I am going to lock myself in my room and binge watch Netflix. Like, there's no more risking my life for the gospel. But it literally says Epaphroditus, he just wants to get back to the Philippians. And, and what you need to know is that in the best of conditions, for Epaphroditus to get... Um, to get from Rome back to Philippi in the best weather conditions, it would have taken him six weeks. But the average journey from where Paul was in Rome to Philippi, the average time it would have taken him was three months. And so he's saying, like, Epaphroditus was so sick he was about to die, but I'm sending him back immediately. Like, he'll be there in three months. And Epaphroditus is like, yes, I can't wait to see you guys, to his church family. He's like, you know, I just escaped death, but I'm coming back. All right, three-month journey. Like, we don't do that today, but we could, I guess, if we wanted to. So, anyway, um, everybody needs an Epaphroditus, someone who is willing to put their own interests and problems aside to focus on the others. And so, really quick, um, we're going to point, Paul is about to point to his last example of a humble person. And he does this, he points to himself. He does it very briefly, and he does it very humbly. And so, um, I'm going to wrap it up, but I'm going to jump back to verses 12 through 18, and we will have covered basically all of chapter 2. And so um, this, this part, it practically preaches itself. And so just listen, uh, listen clearly to the words that Paul is writing. I'm going to pick it up um, in verse 12. He says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm, I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Okay, so Paul's tying it, he's tying it all together here because all those questions that he opened up with at the beginning of chapter 2 saying, like, are you fulfilled from being in a relationship with Christ? He's saying, then show it. Then this is the application part because he's saying, live this out because the world is watching you. He says, work to show how worthy the gospel really is. To know about something and to be about something are two completely different things. Like, we know that. You can be about, you can say to know about something, but to be about it is something completely different. And so, and Paul is saying this, like, he again wants them to present as credible witnesses to an unbelieving world. He doesn't want to make it harder for them to believe. And so, he also says this, he says, um, work hard to show the results of your salvation. And when I was reading that, I was like, just like, kept unpacking it in my mind. But he said, work hard to show the results of your salvation. He doesn't say, work hard to earn your salvation, because the thing is, you can't earn being saved. Like, we already are saved. But he's saying, work hard to show the results. Now that you are saved, really live like you are. Show the results of it. And so he'll go on in verse 13. I'm just picking it right back up where he left off. For it is God working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice, even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just as your faithful service is an offering to God. 
And so there are so many good parts of this letter, so many, but this, this is one of my favorite lines because when you think of all the things that Paul has instructed the Philippians to do thus far in the letter, he said, he said don't be selfish. Don't try to impress, pre- impress others. Think of others as better than yourself. He said, put others' interests above your own. He said, live clean, innocent lives. He said, do everything without complaining. He said, hold firmly to the word of life. And so when I read these things, sometimes I go, I don't know if I can do all that. I, I really don't know if I can always do all that. And so I say, yeah, I want to hold firm to the word of life. Yes, I want to do everything without complaining. But in the culture and the world we live in today, when the world gets really, really dark, what we need is to hold firmly to the word of life. And so I find myself going, I don't know if I can do that. But then, but then I go back to verse 13. And and that changes everything. All that goes away because it says this, For it is God working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And so it is God. It is God working in you. And it says that, and it implies this, that even if you don't have the desire, even if you have no desire, zero to that desire to do any of these things, it says that God will work in you and he will give you his desires. Then once he gives you the desires, guess what? He's going to give you the power. And so God doesn't leave you hanging. And so it's not you and your power, but it's God and and God and his power. And so the best thing, one of the best things that ever happened for us was, was God coming to earth and saying, let me show you the way. Now we have access to the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And so then if you, if you catch later, Paul starts talking about at the end of that, um, of that 12 through 17, he starts talking about that living and dying thing again. We talked about that last week <clears throat> on that Paul, he'll kind of, last week he was in a debate with himself over like, should I live? Should I die? I don't know which is better because Paul says to live is Christ, to die is gain. And so Paul realizes when he's on earth, he's serving Christ, but he realized when he dies, he's going to go be with Christ. And so he, he's literally at a war with himself because he goes, I don't know, I can't decide. Should I stay here and live or should I die and go be with Christ? And so he's doing it again. He's going, if I, if I, uh, he says, either way, if I die for Christ, then I'm going to rejoice because I'll be pouring my life out like a liquid offering to God because he, he literally can't decide. Should I stay here and preach with you all or should I go die and be with Christ? And so Everybody, everybody needs a Paul who's going to pour themselves out and in doing so is pouring into others. Everybody needs a Timothy, someone, someone who genuinely cares for their well-being and is willing to stand next to them through whatever life throws their way. And everybody needs an Epaphroditus, someone who's willing uh, to put their own, own needs aside, to put your needs and the other needs above their own. And so if, if you want to spend your whole life looking for, for that Timothy, that Paul, Epaphroditus, um, my prayer for all of us is that we would just get busy being one for someone else, that we would just get busy being those people for others. Because this, a citizen of heaven promotes the gospel at all cost. A citizen of heaven is humble. A citizen of heaven is selfless. A citizen of heaven strives to put others' interests above their own. And so what is a life worthy of the gospel? Fighting together for one purpose with unity and humility. And so I just have to wonder this. What if if by the way that we chose to live, we presented the gospel as how worthy it really was, not how worthy we were? But what if by the words we chose to say and the actions we chose to take, we painted a picture of how how worthy the gospel was. And so by the way that we took Paul's advice, we were basically begging people to take this truth that we have. Like, what if our actions begged people to believe what we believed? Because I'll tell you this right now, this letter is to the Philippians, but this letter is to the return. This letter is to Northside Christian. This letter is to New Albany. This letter is to all believers. And it's a letter for you and me today. And it's saying, can you take this position? Can you look at others and say, How can my life be for you, for the glory of Christ? How can I serve you? How can I encourage you? How can I look out for you? How can I lift you up? Because Paul, his hope is to urge us to imitate Christ. The whole reason we do this is to look to Christ and imitate him. And so my prayer is for us to just hold on to that and to begin to go, what what if my actions, what if my words matched up with the way that Paul is saying Jesus lived his life?